your host, Sean Lynn, in the pub for a dram with friends where we talk about faith, family, food, and fun. Pull up a chair and I'll pour you a drink. Episode 87. We are extremely excited to welcome Joelle Marin, a beloved daughter of the Father, into the pub. Sit back as we have a Prosecco. So there's nothing formal about it and just we talk about faith, family, food and fun and, <laughs> okay. and see where the conversation goes. I've got a couple questions for you and... Sure. So, and it's, uh, like I said, very informal and, and I'm interested to hear where about yourself that, uh, Deacon Harold sent out that package that, uh, looked very intriguing. Thank you. And, uh, yeah. that's why I'd love to, I'm glad you're able to join us here in the pub. So. Well, I'm, I'm happy to join. <laughs> so for those that, uh, don't know who Joelle is, can you please tell our friends in the pub who, who is Joelle? Who is Joelle? <laughs> That's like the worst interview question ever. No, I'm just kidding. Isn't it so difficult to, to talk about who you are? Um, I think I'm still trying to learn who I am. I wrote a whole book about it and just finding that identity again, that I'm a beloved daughter of God. That's like the most important thing about me. Um, I also, um, I'm an actress, a speaker, a TV host, and a writer. I just wrote a book, Master of the Pieces, and um, I was a, a girl who was very, very lost and who's been found. So that's it in a nutshell. Wow, that's uh, very profound. And uh, yes, that was one of the things that intrigued me was uh, the actress part because as it sounds like you've become a very devout Catholic and uh, I've got a son that just graduated from university as a, an actor and <laughs> so uh, hmm. I'm uh, interested on how to father that. <laughs> we've supported him and he's been he's been doing very well. Like the university he was in, they only take six males a year into the program. And, oh, really? Wow. And then he he graduated with distinction, So, but mm -hmm. we're wanting him to hold on to how his dad has raised him. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's definitely, it's, it's difficult in the secular world. And, um, you know, I've been on stage since I was five. I was acting at a very young age and did several, you know, independent films and I was a TV host for ABC, like all this stuff. But that, that was actually part of my broken pieces uh, part because I had a tragedy in my life when I was little and I pulled away from God. So I started using the gifts God gave me in an unhealthy way where I would like hide behind the character or take on the life of someone else thinking, you know, I didn't know who I was anyway. That's what, it, what a great question. You said, who are you? <laughs> I'm still, like I said, figuring that out. But I think we, we're all in that spot, right? Like, are we always walking around confident knowing who we are? Or are we having to re-remind ourselves of our true purpose on life and how short our time is here, right? And so I had gotten to the point where I let all the broken pieces smash me and started hiding behind characters and being in secular Hollywood. Um, you know, there's chapters in my book that go much deeper, but I, you know, I mean, I was assaulted by a co-star. I booked a, um, during pilot season, it was like this huge dream come true, booked um, a job for the lead role in a nighttime soap opera and my co-star assaulted me, like completely shocked me. I had to walk away from the project. The producers didn't leave me. So there was just a lot of that. Um, and I moved out to LA for five years and there was just all this stuff that kind of darkens the whole purpose of why God gave you certain gifts and talents and what you're supposed to use it for, you know, and it, to be honest, I turned away from it for many, many years. And even, uh, it was about 11 years ago, I had this kind of near death experience where I saw my life flash before my eyes. I never thought like I would ever go back on camera or stage or anything again. Matter of fact, I made a vow that I wouldn't. And I had to renounce that vow because, um, God, did that and resurrected those things. So I think it's like when you start to realize he gives you each and every person like different gifts, graces, talents, like a mission, a purpose, 
to make the world more beautiful, to bring his love into the world, to bring his heart into the world. You know, acting can be very prophetic in the sense of not like you're predicting the future, but you are like sharing God's heart with the world through different characters, even some of the characters that are darker, you know, to, to like, where do you find God's light in those places? And so for me, it was just a complete um, resurrection of a dream that I thought was smashed, broken to pieces. I thought like, if I were to hand this to God, he'd be like, oh, no, no, that's bad for you. Like, I don't want that for you. And he would have smashed it, you know, but that's just not who God is. So learning like who God the Father is and that he gave us all this purpose and mission. And when we use it for good, watching what he does with it. And I've just been amazed since I gave my yes. And like, you know, and I have a spiritual director, a priest, and I was just like really discerning if God wanted me to go back into this. And, um, you know, I produced a film called Fully Known about identity in Christ during COVID when there was like, you know, the kind of the world stopped. I had a lot more time to pray and, and talk to the Lord. And he put this on my heart and I had no idea what it was going to do, but he, he did it. You know what I'm saying? I just said yes. And it got 24 nominations and four wins and, you know, it's just been a miracle. So. Wow. What, what program was that that got the 24 nominations? Oh, it was, it was at like and top Christian award ceremonies around the country. And, and one or two of them were like the two biggest in the world. People flew in from other continents. Like I knew nothing there. This wasn't like, Oh, I had connections. I had not been in the Christian film business. This was like just a God thing. Like I just did what he said and he helped create the product and then it had those results. So I just praise God. Well, and I was talking to somebody not that long ago about this topic where, you know, even where industries are dark and like the, we, I was talking about how the internet was this black hole of, that you could get lost in where mm -hmm. Pope John Paul II talked about the need to be present and evangelize in there. And, and so much so in the arts and we talk about the chosen as one of the, you know, one of those opportunities for actors that have just brought huge followings and you, you, oh, yeah. you un don't understand why Hollywood doesn't see <laughs> <laughs> some of these successes yeah there, there's a hunger in the human heart for truth and there's so many projects out there that I couldn't or wouldn't do just because of my faith you know and so when you like I said if you take like mass media even mother Angelica when she founded EWTN she had gone on someone else's tv show and she's like what this just reaches how many people she's like I gotta get me one of these you know she wanted yeah. to get the satellite dish and I feel the same way um, you know, like where you could just read and I'll, I'll preach to one person. It doesn't matter. You know, I've, I've worked on the streets with the homeless for years and it's not about a, a numbers game or anything like that, but you can reach people through media in a new way where like, so for example, when I go give a talk somewhere, most of the people that come either their friend brought them or they want to be there. There's a difference between that kind of viewer and someone who's at home who doesn't necessarily know what they believe, or they're afraid of what they believe, maybe they don't want their friends to see that they kind of checked this film out or this TV show out, but their heart is still hungering for truth. And so it's just a different way to reach people um, where they're at and meet them where they're at. And I think being true to the story, being true to characters, life and suffering, um, I think, you know, one time as I was talking, someone said, well, how's your life now that you have no suffering? <laughs> and I just started <laughs> laughing. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, I don't know who's preaching that gospel, but it's not me. Uh, it's not about like you turn your life to God and you have no suffering because Jesus died on a cross, right? It's like that we now know how to unite our cross with his. We know how to get through life. We know how to uh, allow him to make beauty from the ashes to trust him more. You know, to walk, like you said, in the identity. Who am I? You know, I'm beloved. I am chosen. I'm good. I'm made for good. I'm made for a purpose. You know, it's, I am God's child. And like, if we start walking in that authority that we're God's children and it's his power, like in us and working through us, then it takes the pressure off of us. <laughs> and it's really, you know, the results are in his hands. It's just kind of, but we have to work with what he gave us. We have to be willing to submit it. And I think even different, you know, singers and painters and, you know, writers, 
you know, I think a lot of times there's a fear of whatever. I mean, you don't even have to be in the arts. You can be in any field. You can be a doctor. Um, you can be a mom. And you just don't feel like you're enough. You just feel like, I can't do this. But that's not the message, you know. It's like, in our weakness, we're made strong. The, the Bible's all about uh, the paradoxes of everything. And and that when we, you know, we lose our lives, we gain our lives. You know, when we give, we receive. And so I think when we can push past those very barriers of fear, and I certainly had so many, for so many years, despite, you know, any success or what it looked like to the world, I never felt enough. And I finally feel like I'm enough because I feel like if I say I'm not, then that means God's not enough. It would be like an insult to him. And he's enough, you know, and sometimes I think we make God feel like he's not enough, but of course... He is. So I, I think it really does stem down to that identity that we are enough. You know, we're made in the image of God and he's enough. And we can do all things, you know, through him who strengthens us. And not there's not going to be trials, not that there's not going to be suffering, not that it's going to be easy, but that there will be joy in this of all of that. And it's possible. Well, and the suffering now has a purpose that you can offer as a gift to God and uh, partake in uh, the suffering of the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for allowing me to participate in your suffering. Uh, I did that for a couple things, like when the bee flew through the window and stung me on the face. <laughs> That's all. All I could say was uh, to my wife and but the, and you talk about Mother Angelica. What a great witness! Uh, mm -hmm. I had the great fortune of, of meeting her. I've actually got a couple pictures up here when we were down doing some TV shows in the late nineties with, uh, at EWTN and, yeah. and it was, uh, what a, what a story. And yeah. she had, she had lots of suffering, but she also had miracle healings and, and that's where a lot of people can't see the miraculous Mm -hmm. that's all around them. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and one of her, my favorite quotes of Mother Angelica, is she said, in order to do the miraculous, you have to be willing to do the ridiculous. So sometimes God will ask something of you that you're like, that just sounds so crazy. <laughs> but you won't know unless you try. Yep. Um, and lately this, this uh, image has kind of been coming to mind of, you know, the disciples in the boat, and like Peter, he's a professional fisherman. Like he knows his stuff. He knows where to fish. He knows where to put the net. You know, a lot of times we think we know the best thing to do or best time to do it. And Jesus is like, yeah, right now, throw your net right there. Like, you know, he could see what's under the water. And I'm sure Peter's just thinking, what? And we're like, what? But there's nothing there. Like, there's no way there could be anything there. And Jesus is like, just do it. Just do it, you know, and see what happens. And then you cast your net. As like all this stuff was hidden under the water that only God could see. And so I think it's like no matter what uh, industry you're in or if you're in ministry, everything we do is ministry. Everything we do with our body becomes a prayer because of who we are in Christ. But it's like, why are we so afraid to see what's under the water? And what's the worst that happens? We throw the net in and nothing happens. There's no fish. Okay, but at least we tried. We have the peace of mind. Like, okay, I tried. Lord, you know, the results were in your hands. But what if you throw it in and you just, whatever, and I'm not talking like a booming voice coming out of the sky, you know, let us not confuse what God is. That'd be great. I would love if he talked to me like that all the time. Um, I do tell people, if you spend enough time in silence, God will whisper in your heart. If you spend enough time in silence, you can spend a lot of time. But he'll talk to us through circumstance, through opportunities, through the Bible, through this, the scripture readings, through so many things because he's omni potent and he's omnipresent, which means he's everywhere. So if we listen and we follow, we could just even ask the Holy Spirit to inspire us and just start asking, what's the next step I could take? If we think that's what he's inspiring us to do and we do it, then the results are in his hands and there's like a peace, like, okay, I tried, you know, and I think I have a greater fear now of not trying than trying and failing, because I think not trying is failing. And I think trying and what the world might call as failing is actually not failing, it's success, because I tried, if that makes sense. Well, and that's, uh, there was a uh, men's retreat in BC where they were talking about the man in the arena, the famous uh, quote from Roosevelt, where, you know, it's, it's not the guy on the sideline, but the man that actually gets in the arena, win or lose, He's the one that uh, makes the difference 
for yeah. trying and and yes i'm uh a lot's resonating. You talk about the big booming voice. Some have <laughs> accused me of having that uh, as a, where I can use that for God's glory with the boys I coach in rugby or uh, if talking to the men at men's conferences. So it's uh, God being that instrument of God yes. to the person next to you is it, that's how we're going to win souls is, is being present yes. to those around us. So, yeah. And I, and I think like being present, um, it just keeps coming up in my prayer because there's constantly distractions, you know, like even just before we started this, the garbage trucks going by, I'm like, really of all the times. Right. And then say you go to adoration to pray and all of a sudden they're like trimming the trees and there's like, there's just, we're surrounded by noise and we're surrounded by distractions, but just learning to be present and, you know, just going with the flow and not letting those get in the way of what God's asking of us and continuing to move forward. It's, it's, it's a big difference. And, um, you know, I've lost a lot of people in my life, starting with my sister when I was six years old and just had some deaths this past year. And my dad died and my spiritual father died, who was a Carmelite friar. And it just, I think, you know, I, and I'm excited to die. I'll stay as long as God wants because I believe I believe in heaven. But I think that it's those moments are wake up calls to us of, uh, you know, who are we and why are we here? Um, and are we going to have a regret? Like if today, a lot of times what I try to do to push myself, even when I'm afraid to do something is to say like, well, if today was my last day on earth, you know, would I, would I be upset that I didn't try? And, uh, you know, I think that, and I, and I, and I just, I'll do whatever I feel like God's saying. And then I'll just say to him, like, well, Lord, you're not ever going to tell me I didn't try, you know? And there was one time I felt him saying, yeah, I might tell you, you've tried a little too hard. <laughs> so, so I rather try too hard than not at all, but it is also finding that balance, you know, um, yep. doing what we think he's asking and then letting the results of his hand and not being, you know, like trying to get ahead of him either. Just going at his face, being present. If we haven't loved, we missed it all, you know. Yeah, my, my, my wife often accuses me of planting trees rather than seeds. <laughs> and uh, so I, you know, I'm working on saplings at least. So that uh, it's not as blunt, but it's, I too lost my dad in the last uh, six oh, months. And, and, and so I, but when you were talking about that loss, it brought, as uh, I just retired from 33 and a half years of policing where I had to go give those notifications. I had to go to those deaths and, uh, yeah, trying to be there for the people is, and those are not things that you want to yeah. carry for people and just, uh, it, it is hard and that's where I can't imagine not going through having God in your life when you go through those, those times, because yeah. I, I've been blessed also with brothers that are praying for us. And, and so, yeah, it's, it's imp important. And that's one of the things that we try to encourage men is not to be alone, to build that brotherhood because mm -hmm. so many, they, they too feel that they're not worthy and of, of the love of God, the father, which is a lie. Yeah. You know, what? I have a soft spot for men in my heart. Like when I, when I give events, I love women too, but when the guys come up to me after and just start pouring their hearts out, it just, it does something to me because I think a lot of times as women, we think, Oh, we're the only one who struggles, but men have a lot of um, insecurities. They feel inadequate as you know, they've been emasculated by society and sometimes by the people closest to them. And like, I think there's nothing more beautiful than like a manly man. And it's not what the world says that's going to make a man. It's like that the man within, you know, who is drawing his confidence from God, who knows the love of the Father, um, who knows he's forgiven, who knows uh, why he struggles and what to do with that instead of letting it overcome him to fight back, you know, to not give up um, on, on 
just the potential of who he can be and, and to surround himself with people who are lifting him up. And, um, yeah, it's just, it just does something to me. Uh, and I think it's, it's also the feminine heart. Like we're made to receive men in a different way than a guy would share his feelings with a guy. So I, I think there's beauty in masculinity and femininity and just, um, understanding that God has made us to complement each other. No one's better than the other. There's no competition. <laughs> you know, uh, I think when things happen, everyone could take it too far, right? With the feminist movement and all that. And um, I think there's there's just no competition. It's just the beauty of how God created us. And, and I just wish so much for men to be walking in that authority to, um, if they can appreciate themselves for who they are and understand their desires better, I think they'll be able to appreciate women to another degree and, and see the compliment, you know, the compliment of that. And, uh, yeah, the world would be a better place. <laughs> Let's put it that well, way. And we, we have St. Joseph, Joseph as our role model. He's mm -hmm. up there and just, you know, a humble servant to his family. But he was not a weak man in any, mm -hmm. like, like Mother Angelica said, old men don't walk to Egypt. Like... <laughs> <laughs> he uh yeah. he was a he was a, a manly man and if you ever get a chance to visit the cathedral in Wichita, Kansas, I stopped by there this summer. Yeah. There is a statue there of Saint Joseph that is I one of my favorites, so Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, and the you know, the culture is just kinda confused men. They think to be a man you have to be uh rich and drive a certain car and dress a certain way and have muscles and all that. And it's fine if you have those things and use them for the glory of God. Unfortunately, most people don't. Um, but it's more important to, to have that strong interior, not an act on the outside, but really deep within to know who you are and to be able to love from that place. You know, that's really, really attractive. So, so at this time in the interview, I usually jump to food and, uh, Okay. <laughs> I ask a dad's dish. I don't know. Are you, uh, what, what dish do you make for the family that keeps everybody coming back asking for more? Oh my goodness. Well, I think my grandmother's recipe for meatballs is the clear winner of that. Um, yeah. I mean, I grew up, so basically I was raised Italian. I'm, I'm part French too, uh, as well and have a little other things, but I was raised in the Italian culture. And actually have a pilgrimage coming up to Italy in March for anyone who wants to go. I'll, um, I don't have the link yet, but it will be announced very soon. So um, I'm of Italian heritage. My grandmother's sauce, her meat sauce, her meatballs. Like, yeah, no, you can't get that at a restaurant. <laughs> so. <laughs> no, that would be awesome. Do you share recipes? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I... but the thing is, it's like, so my grandmother, before she died, she, she wrote down all her recipes for me on paper. But it's like a little bit of this, a little bit of that. A teaspoon of this, you know, it, it, or there's not even measurements. It's like a pinch of this, a lot of that, a little bit of this. So you're like, well, how many is that? Because they just knew, she, you know, she was just brought up that way and knew what to put in everything. So I can't say. Well, she that she cooks right. like me, like everybody asks for the recipe and I'm going, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, it's, and the kids, the kids have had some failures along the way, uh, I don't know if you remember Arthur the Aardvark cartoon growing up. Uh, I don't. And uh, anyhow, there's a, at our 25th wedding anniversary, my kids got up and sang a song that goes, my dad's a chef, you think that's great? Just try and guess what's on your plate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, no. So you're not yeah. a cook? You like to cook or not? Oh, yeah. I've competed in barbecue competitions. I oh. catered. Well, I just catered uh, dinner for 200 a couple of weeks ago. And wow. We have a barbecue outreach that uh, we we did a, uh, the cathedral last Saturday and some basic stuff. But, yeah, I've, I'm open to trying and tackling just about anything. So our family gatherings with my siblings was like a cooking competition every time we got together for a big oh, feast. Fun. So. Yeah, well, it, you know, growing up Italian, everything was food and yeah. parties. And I'll never forget one time my aunt was like, this is a really, really small party. Like, I feel so bad. And she, I said, how many? She's like, oh, there's only 60 people. 
<laughs> like they were trying to keep it small. So I just thought that was really funny. And, um, you know, even when I go back to visit, they live in New York. It's just, it's all about the food and, you know, what are we going to eat? That's kind of the main planning. And especially on Sundays, it was pasta Sundays. And we'd all gather at my grandma's house. So beautiful memories. Yeah. So do you make your pasta from scratch or? No, I'm not that skilled. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I should just to try to uh, impress you next time. Um, I would love to learn that. Do you, have you done that before? Yes, I've played around with it a bit. And yeah, I've even it made it for my sourdough starter at one time. So mm -hmm. I made some sourdough pasta. But uh, it's, awesome. yeah, it, it's a lot of work though. So I usually just buy the buy it. Yeah, I actually, to be honest, I kind of switched over to protein pasta. Just got a little more protein in it so i'll have to have a look for that yeah we, in calgary here we have a very large italian community and we've oh, awesome. uh, i had lunch at the italian club just on friday with uh, one of the gentlemen that came to our conference mm -hmm. so what advice would you give your 18 year old self oh my goodness <laughs> there's so much um listen to my grandma because she was right and um, at 18 years old, she threw me into the confessional by my hair. I was just a bit of a wild child, I, you know, a bit of a rebel. Everything could have always been worse than it was just because of my life. And I feel like my guardian angel was always on overtime. But, um, yeah, I would say, like, I wish I knew that God was real. I wish I knew that he loved me despite all the sadness I had in my life. I wish I knew who I was because I was just, even though I looked successful to the world and I was modeling and I had a you know, billboard in Times Square and like these things, it's almost like they owned me and I, I never even knew who I was inside. So I would say like, dear 18 year old me, you're loved. You're good. You know, God is within you. You can do anything and you don't get your... A value from what other people say either, you know, and just realizing the importance um, of being loved and being known by the only one who matters and walking in that rather than trying to show the world who I am and put on a fake exterior and like um, worship the things of the world that don't satisfy, you know, they'll just bring you down when you turn them into your idols. Oh, that's awesome. So I don't know if you, uh, I ride I've ridden motorcycles with Jeff Cavins and, and mm -hmm. talks about riding with your posse or more <laughs> Jeff rides with me. Uh, <laughs> cause I do all the organizing. Uh, oh, okay. Yes. I've heard it. I know the group you guys go out with. Yeah. That's fun. Yeah. yeah. So he talks about riding with your posse. And so who are your go-to saints? Who are the ones that you call on? Yeah, um, so I have a board of directors. Uh, Jesus, obviously, is my CEO. And I have St. Catherine of Siena, uh, St. Anthony of Padua, St. Padre Pio, St. Gemma, uh, St. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi. Um, because, so I started Marin Ministries on her feast day, which is also St. Padre Pio's birthday. Uh, I'm going to say St. Mother Angelica because I'm going to tell you she's a saint. Uh, I don't know when she'll be canonized, but she should be. Um, I have like I have a whole father Patrick Payton because uh, you know I so I'm a TV host as well for Shalom World TV and I, he did a film Pray he was like the family that prays together stays together about the Rosary so Father Patrick Payton um, Mother Saint Mother Teresa because of her work with the poor and seeing Jesus and everyone so I, I mean I have a huge I wish I could tell you just one or two but these that's like, quite the boardroom you've got there yeah. Uh... It's a pretty big boardroom. And, oh, and St. Rita. And so, like, for the pilgrimage we're going to do in Italy, we're going to go to St. Padre Pio. We're going to St. Francis of Assisi. We're doing St. Rita, the Miracle at Lanciano. So it's like, um, I, yeah, I have a pretty big group. <laughs> that's that's amazing. Yeah, I uh, I was blessed to go with the boys' rugby team to Italy, and we, we visited the, the tomb of uh, St. Anthony, who's a... Uh, Mm -hmm. One that we call on often here I with eight in kids. In, yeah, in Padua. Yes, yeah, we're going there too. And he's one of my favorites, yeah. Yeah, I heard. So, yeah, and Mother Angelica, I'd love to see her canonized because I, I keep telling people that I 
it'd be nice to show my grandkids and great grandkids. Here's here here I am with a saint, like a picture yeah. with a saint, right? So, oh, that's, she is. Uh, no question. Yeah, I nominate well, her. <laughs> there you go. Well, I I. I poured myself some four roses because it's not often that we get a rose to visit the pub. And uh, thank you for joining us. And, and this I don't know whiskey, if... but this is uh, Prosecco, Italian champagne. So it's, but it looks kind of like whiskey, right? Yes. The, the, it, there's like little stars and sparkly things inside. <laughs> so I have to be like cute and fancy and girly too. The, the, we've got a couple of Italian guys on our men's night out committee and that help organize a fundraiser and they always they always start it with some prosecco as you come in the door for the men so <laughs> it's, uh, but i don't know if you know but the the gaelic term for whiskey is ishkabaha which means water of life and i pray that you continue to lead many souls to the true water of life okay. and thank you for coming to visit us in the pub god willing yes thank you cheers salud <laughs> I hope you have enjoyed this episode of A Dram with Friends. Like and subscribe. Go to all podcast platforms to look for it on podcast or go to godsquad.ca to support our mission.